people should be coming in very soon. We've got one person. Um, Emily. Hi, Emily. <laughs> Emily's a regular. Uh, Rebecca. Hi. Andrew Maki. Hello. And we'll just wait a few more seconds. We're expecting more folks. Uh, perhaps they're running late. Dimitri, hello. Beverly, Paul. Um, welcome, everyone. If you want to let us know where you're tuning in from, that's always much appreciated. And if you want to have a conversation conversation in the chat, please do. Um, we love a nice chatty audience. Um, let us know what brought you here tonight. Um, and again, let us know where you're tuning in from. Ahead and get started. And I totally forgot to open my script. So I'm just going to keep talking um, <laughs> while I do that. Um, hi, all. I'm Omar Acevedo, and I'm the literary program coordinator here at the Mark Twain Housing Museum in Hartford, Connecticut. Thank you for joining us for this per, uh, virtual program for Beautyland. Virtual programs like this are produced in part with support honoring the late Frank Lord. We are grateful to honor his memory with these programs. Um, and I also want to thank our, our members. Um, if you're not a member, please consider supporting our museum by becoming a member. Um, there are many benefits to becoming a member. Uh, these include uh, free or discounted admission to our author programs, um, free admission to the House and Museum, year-round discounts in the store and the cafe, and much more. Uh, please visit our website for more information or just send me an email and I'll get you set up. Um, now on to our guests. Our author, Marie-Helene Bertino, wrote Parakeet, 2 a.m. at the Cat's Pajamas and the story collection Safe as Houses. She was the 2017 Frank O'Connor International Short Story Fellow in Cork, Ireland. Her work has received the O. Henry Prize, the P Pushcart Prize, and many other prizes. Um, and she's received fellowships from McDowell, Sewanee, and New York City Center for Fiction, and has twice been featured on NPR Selected Shorts. She teaches creative writing at New York University and Yale University. Our, moderate, our moderator, Carrie Anna Provost, writes queer romance and climate fiction has a bi-weekly Connecticut news junkie column and publishes Real Hartford, of which I am a big fan of. Um, when not knee deep in green transportation advocacy, Carrie Anna is busy winning coveted awards like most miles walked in an alley cat race. During this event, we encourage you to have a conversation with each other in the chat, as I said earlier. Um, if you have a specific question though, please post that directly into our Q&A Q and A section, which is on the bottom left of the of the screen, um, and you can ask your question at any time. You don't have to wait until the Q and A, um, which will be in about forty minutes, thirty five or forty minutes. Um, so that is all uh, for now from me. Um, I'll be back later. Um, please sit back and enjoy this conversation, and I'll turn this over to Marie, Helene, and Carrie. Thanks, Omar. Um, it is a joy to chat with you, Marie Helene. Uh, Beauty Land, a little prop here. It features an instantly lovable, instantly trustworthy narrator, Adina, who is an alien on Earth, not from adolescence, but from the moment she is born. Can you begin by talking about where Adina comes from, both the character and the inspiration for her, and sort of help us get situated into like what this book is about. Sure. I think becoming situated with this book is uh, an important part of the process of reading it. And I want to start by, by thanking you, Carrie Anna, for having me tonight and for being in conversation with me. Um, and thank you to Omar and the Mark Twain House. This is really lovely to be a part of such a cool reading series. So I'm honored to be here. 
Beauty Land is essentially a novel about a woman who believes she is on earth to report on human beings and human life to her superiors who are 300,000 light years away on a different planet. So her name is Adina Giorno. And from a very early age, at age four, she becomes what she calls activated. And with a fax machine that her mother has pulled from the trash and repurposed, she sends her notes on human beings to her superiors. And she does so throughout her entire life. And the book, Beautyland, takes its structure from the life and death cycle of a star, which has five parts and Adina's life has five developmental stages so she so the book structure echoes the developmental stages of a star and how the book came about is that I wrote a short story several years ago called sometimes you break their hearts sometimes they break yours about a woman who believes she's an alien and all of her notes on human beings. And it reflected essentially my lifelong feeling that I just don't understand sometimes what human rituals are for, where they came from. Um, Many things about living on the earth um, have remained foreign to me, no matter how acclimated I become. And so I I began to keep a folder of notes on my desktop called Notes on Human Beings, where I would put things I noticed about societal beliefs on Yoko Ono, for example, and the Beatles, how everyone loves fried eggs on things, which I've never been able to understand, like even pizza. Um, And from the small to the big, I was, I guess, documenting what I would call the profound mundane. And then over the course of several years, as the folder got bigger and bigger, I began to wonder if there might be a book in it. And through these notes glimmered a character who would be keeping those notes. And I figured she would have to have the perspective of someone who was at a distance from human beings. And so Adina Giorno was born And after a while, she became an extraterrestrial. Looks like Carrie might be frozen, but she'll be back soon. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, I was like, wow, I have stunned her. (laughs) Um, I take it by your shock silence that you agree. So, um, yeah, that is how Beautyland came to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I spent about seven to eight years writing the novel and revising it with my pals and uh, with my agent, Claudia Ballard, and with my editor, eventually Jenna Johnson at FSG and with their very wise notes Adina became you know the character she is now great I'll just step in for for a few seconds while sure (laughs) yeah Omar what would you like to talk about (laughs) (laughs) oh there she is (laughs) she'll be here very soon I'm happy to vamp. I have a theater background, so <laughs> I could. Um... Oh, there she is. <laughs> oh, uh, you're still muted, Carrie. Is Carrie having audio problems? She just needs to unmute. Um, Maybe she's still signing in. 
looks like she's on the phone, which is a little, um, a little bit more complicated from my own experience. Oh, you know what? <laughs> you know what might be a good idea? How about as you all figure this out, I will read my favorite section from yes. Beauty Land. Does that make sense? I was like, yes. oh, right. I could just read from the book I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> um, one thing that's been really cool about the past few weeks as I've been reading from Beautyland for the first time is realizing that Beautyland is essentially about every single thing on earth. And it's an everything book, as Salman Rushdie would, would call it. And it's been, so it's been really, a, it's been a surprise and really cool that I can kind of match what I read with where I'm reading and with whom I'm in conversation. That's been really fun. And so last week was Valentine's Day and I read a page long sentence from the closest Adina Giorno gets to a romantic relationship. Um, Adina doesn't really have a, well, I, I don't want to ruin anything, but she doesn't have quote unquote traditional relationships. I'll, I'll put it that way. But she does meet a special boy who has synesthesia um, at a literary event. And when they have their first date, it gave me an opportunity to do something I really love to do, which is write a page long sentence that kind of echoed what can be the uh, catharsis of falling in love. So I'll just read that sentence now. And then hopefully by the end, Kariana will have rejoined us. If he leaves, I won't forgive myself. So she apologizes and asks him to stay, which is embarrassing after trying so hard to make him leave. But she promises a beer and a grilled cheese and brings him upstairs, her apartment shaking from a passing train. Butternut unfurls a spirited cheer for this boy taking off his dark jacket and she doesn't know if her little dog is a prophet or a traitor and Miguel says it's the best he's ever had about the grilled cheese and she says really the best okay and he says I mean it sister best ever and Adina knows she will have to deal with every ugly thing she's been ignoring to be half as good as he deserves and this makes her tired in advance and he says, we can finish them in the morning about the dishes. So they lie in the blue light of caress hair braiding that makes everything in her bedroom seem aquatic. And she asks, has he ever heard of Martin's Aquarium in Northeast Philadelphia? And he says, no, he's never been to Philadelphia, but doesn't sound afraid of it or the shape she can't get rid of that it makes in her, how it sharpens her remarks and pulls down the sides of her mouth. And she grows more tired because of what she'll have to explain. Maybe even the very big thing. She's only told her mother and Tony, she wishes she could call Tony now. He says he'd like to hear about it if she feels like sharing. And she says it would take decades. Then begins with the tales of the show off beta fish and the soft green nets. but. These don't make sense unless she tells him about her mother and the flying man and how she's never experienced a new life level without pain, some brutal shedding. And she thinks, oh no, she thinks all for the want of a grilled cheese, which doesn't apply, but is the kind of logic one exhibits when finding oneself on the shaky, glittery brink of something that's probably going to fuck her up in a way that if humanity or entropy or Andromeda is kind, will turn out to be important, will at least not hurt, at least not much, will maybe bridge the distance between her and everything, between her and herself. And he says, green is big terrain, you know, about the soft green nets. So what color, frog or lentil, or emerald, or lima bean, or lily pad, or pine needle, or grass. Mm. And I'll stop there. 
Wow. So you were talking about this anesthesia and um, I was going and I was as I was reading, one of the things that I kept wondering from the beginning was, am I supposed to believe that Adina is literally an alien from outer space or is she alien in all of these other ways? And one of the first things I picked up on is, you know, is she neurodiverse? Because there's a lot of sound sensitivity. Um, and, you know, or is she just a misfit? Is it because she's first generation American? Queer? Like there's all of these other identities or is it all of these things at once? And that's not my question. Um, <laughs> but what I liked was that <laughs> you can pick any of those and it's the story still points back to questions about alienation and searching for home, trying to have this found family that where do you belong? Um, and one of those outside identities that you portray so well is the lower income working class person in a way that I don't feel like gets shown a lot in writing or on television shows or really anywhere in this, this like genuine way. And one of the early places you see it is Adina's mother shopping the clearance section of the discount store and the fact that she, you know, she brings home these little trashed treasures that she thinks can still have use, like the fax machine. Um, and so Adina could have been launched anywhere on earth, right? But what she could, why not send her to a suburban home somewhere? Um, why this particular class setting? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that that really lovely question that encompasses so many themes of beauty land, like um, neurodiversity, queerness, alienation, her particular perspective on the outside of what society deems uh, quote unquote normal and typical. Um, and as far as why put her in a lower income working class neighborhood in Northeast Philadelphia. There are two reasons for that. One reason is for her and one reason is for me. The one that has to do with the reason for her is that the book is about what I would call the profound mundane. And it is about defamiliarizing the familiar. And I think that I would be almost irresponsible if I didn't also defamiliarize what is considered quote unquote the stuff of literature and what makes it onto a page. I mean, even, even the fact that the question has to be asked, why put her here and not in an affluent space or, or in a space of great privilege, I think is, is the answer, you know, is, is why I wanted to do it. For the sheer fact that it would be considered unexpected, though I grew up lower income in Northeast Philadelphia and found found much there that I that I considered to be surprising and magical and almost more magical because it was surprising. So I think these themes are always working in in my speculative worlds. And then the reason I think it was important for me is because and I've spoken about this before, but I was working with a student, her name is Allison Hess, and she's from Appalachia. And she was writing and is writing really brilliant stories with female protagonists set in Appalachia, which I, I haven't read um, the likes of very often either. And she admitted to our workshop that she was terrified to be writing and showing these stories because she didn't think Appalachia um, was a place that many people wanted to read about. And mm. I knew why she was saying that. I think that we have these ideas, um, especially if we've gone to school for writing of what literature is and, and who belongs to it. And I delivered some impassioned monologue to her, like everything belongs in literature. And, and it's exactly these underrepresented voices that we do need to hear from and unexpected places and, and all that. And then I went home and I was like, I am doing the same thing with Northeast Philadelphia and where I come from. And as soon as I realized that, I realized that I had to write about it. So I was like, but how do I make 
something, a place that is defined by its randomness, like auto world and bowling alleys and strip malls. How do I make that magical? And I thought, well, how can I connect auto world to the stars? And that was literally the project of Beautyland. And at a certain point, after when Adina moves for the first and only time in her life, she thinks of what comprises her neighborhood and what makes it so magical. And that line is in there, auto world and the stars. And that was my attempt to say, actually, anything can be significant, even the lives of those we haven't read as often on the page. Mm. Thank you. And I appreciate that because I think that we, I, I get the anxiety of why you might want to avoid writing that if you think about who a lot of readers tend to be or who we think they tend to be, people who have the free time and so forth. And will they relate to that? But um, that was one of the things I really loved about this is and it's captured so well and lovingly it's an insider's look not tourism um mm -hmm. thank you there's also the sting though of watching an alien in all senses start to get her foot in the door only to keep getting it slammed on her so like you see when she's you know the scholarship kid and can kind of you know crack open that door and see um those who are like you know leisurely hanging out on the lawn and you know she can go to the facility and she can go into the classroom but she can't have that whole world and then later on which is i think much more relatable across many um uh, class tiers if you are of a particular age if you grew up female um there's a scene where i just wanted to yell don't go down into the basement you know when you see the <laughs> J girls show up. So it's the, the in girls, the click, where they all have J names. And then because of the era, there's at least two Jens. Um, there's a Janae in Euro. You know, Janae's ability to command respect is related to how high she's able to tease her bangs. You know it's not going to end well for her. Um, how do you write this character who's having these... Uh, not missteps um, sometimes, but just, you know, she keeps getting these little rejections over and over and over, but you don't lose hope for her. You're not saying, well, let's write her off like she's just a doomed character. Um, how do you manage to keep, I guess, a more sense of reality instead of like over-infusing it with cynicism? Mm-hmm. And I think that's a it's a tough line to walk too because I think if you go too hard on, from the author's perspective, if you go too hard on her, it becomes a wash in that cynicism. Um, though you know, I'm sure people have had lives that where that would feel completely accurate, and you can't go too easy on her either. So I was trying to hit you know what would be the realistic line. I think what matters most is how she responds to all of that adversity. And I think that was the most fun for me to write because Adina is able to, and perhaps this is the vantage point of a reporter or a writer, that they have that distancing effect because they're able to not only go through something, but to later process it mm. and perhaps even turn it into something that is useful for others and I think that that is what gets her through her reporting her writing you know her notes at mm. a reading earlier this month in Philadelphia um, my friend this remarkable poet Serene Dompa said that she considers Adina to be a note taker and in camaraderie with other note takers, like, like the poets, she said, which I thought was a high honor. And I think that no matter what happens to her, she's able to move through it because she has that vocation. Yeah, I was thinking of her as like a noticer. And I'm going to get into that in the transmissions in a little bit. But I wanted to talk also that it's not just her having these, you know, kind of falling down. And I'm 
really emphasize worker early life because I don't want to get too into the spoilers later on. Um, but this does cover, you know, throughout her life. Um, and so, you know, it's a collection of observations about humanity that like, how, why are things like this? You know, what's the deal with this? Um, and it covers many emotions. And parts of this book just made me laugh out loud in ways where I wasn't expecting it because it can be, <laughs> you know, they're like, oh gosh, you know, these girls are such jerks. We know this isn't going to go well. And it's it like, you know, this and that. Um, but, you know, one of these passages, it's on page 45. Let me find this. I, so you get, it, it's basically, you know, this indication of that, you know, an alien child can be just as indignant as a human child. Um, hair and nails grow and are cut, limbs lengthen, daughter asks for a dog and mother says no. Daughter asks, well, how about yours pierced then? If she is expected to live in this dogless hell. And I just, I love that. Like, because you can, you know, if you've been an adolescent, like, I think that's just a very relatable mindset. Um, and it's not moping about the dog. It's just comes out very funny. And another moment was um, right after Adina goes to the movies for the first time, and this was extremely relatable for me um, or cathartic maybe. Uh, and so she, you know, goes home and she sends a transmission to her superiors. Um, and so she, her observation, her big takeaway is when it was time to decide the official food of movie watching, human beings did not go for fig newtons or caramel, foods that are silent, but popcorn, the loudest sound on earth. Um, and it's so those kind of moments were, Right, you're talking about like, and and I forget exactly how you put, but like basically magnifying some of the mundane of like that's what you notice that popcorn is the thing that's chosen and it is noisy and obnoxious and not a convenient food. Um, why would you know why would people do this? <laughs> what were some of the things that when you, either when you were writing or I'm thinking probably more likely when you were revising reading it later, did you find yourself surprised about like as being maybe unintentionally humorous because I'm oh. sure that happens for everybody you go and you look back at your own reading you're like wow that's actually really funny oh yeah it's 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 funny I sometimes don't know that people will find things funny until I read them out loud and I hear them laugh and I think oh my god that is the most serious thing I have ever written and people are just straight up laughing at this this is hilarious so it, it sometimes requires the participation of someone else for me to understand that something is funny because I don't tend to laugh a lot while I write. And I'll be totally honest, in case there are any writers listening, sometimes when I am laughing too much while I'm writing, it's normally a line that I eventually have to take out because it's not really serving anything, but it's just there to make me laugh. Um, but the original story that Beautyland was based on um, that I mentioned earlier was a story that I wrote specifically to make myself laugh. I wanted to, I, I thought like, what can I, what would it look like if I wrote a short story and I allowed myself to be as funny as I, I could possibly be? And I didn't worry about it being literary I, I just I just tried to go for the joke. And so that story has a few lines in it that I can still read today and chuckle at. And it was only to cheer myself up. I had been going through a, a tough time and I'm like, I'm gonna write a funny story. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> that's my dog. Um, I'm gonna write a funny story for myself. And those lines did not make it into beauty land, but I think that there are a couple humorous lines, at least I think so, that are in beauty land that still managed to serve the story, I hope. You have to be really careful with humor sometimes when you're writing a novel because, you know, character and, and plot is really important. And it, it isn't, unfortunately, just a you know, a comedic monologue, though sometimes I wish it was. Um, so yeah, so thank you for that question. And I hope that the humor allows me to speak more directly about what I was hoping I could speak directly about in the book.
Mm. And so when you delete those, the parts that you just enjoy, but aren't serving it, do you delete, delete, or do they go into a little special file somewhere? I think that they go into a special file. I, I have, I don't know if you do this, but I have a little folder that's always growing alongside a project that is, that um, is titled things I took out that I keep, that I keep. I could never throw it away. Could you? No, I mean, I think a friend was describing it as like your own fanfic. Like that's what it basically <laughs> amounts to. You just have to like take it out. Like it doesn't belong there, but you have to let yourself write it initially. <laughs> that's a great way of articulating it. Yes. Yeah, it's too painful to just delete it. Um, oh gosh, I have so many questions. Okay, so we we have to go to the fax machine. So I love this so much because of course today a fax machine can only be read as like absolutely obsolete. But in the 80s, and at the time, it's it's not obsolete, but it's still like really clunky machinery. And she is using this to communicate with her superiors, which are far evolved from like past humans. And I'm, you know, wondering like, is it just because she wants to write or you know, like, well, why wouldn't you use a telephone? Or like, I'm just like, is there some sort of other device that could have been used? Um, was there any reason that you picked um, the fax machine for her to be reaching her people back on planet Cricket Rice? There are a few different reasons. It's funny because when you said, why didn't you use a phone? I, I hadn't considered a phone, but if I had, I would have immediately disqualified it because of ET. ET mm -hmm. phone home would have disqualified it immediately. I think I already had enough illusion, illusions to ET in Beautyland. Um, I loved the facts for a few different reasons. First, exactly what you mentioned, the fact that it was in the process of being and going obsolete, even in Adina's childhood, um, it was considered to be this amazing, technologically superior thing, office equipment, though it went out of use pretty quickly. I also liked it as an object. I liked, I, I think that it's very fun looking with fun sounds and like big buttons that I liked on an aesthetic level uh, because the book has a lot to do with sounds and there are a lot of fun sounds to play with. I liked that it was a, I liked that the origin in Adina's life was due to her mother's resourcefulness, that it's something that her mother pulls out of the trash, which I think is a theme in the story, like doing the most with what you're given and what you find. And then finally, because it directly connects with Carl Sagan's writings on extraterrestrials. So Carl Sagan said that even if extraterrestrials were to visit Earth, if they have already, um, or if they are in the process of visiting, that they would be so far beyond us in so many different ways. We are galactic newbies in so many ways that the alien culture would have to speak very slowly. That's what he said. They would have to speak very slowly. Yeah. And so I especially liked the fax machine because it was a way to point to the rudimentary nature of terrestrial life as compared to the her superiors who are eons and eons and eons beyond us. Mm. So... If Adina were to be sending a transmission um, from something in the last couple of months, what's something that you think would be like a thing she would have latched onto? Well, it's interesting. I, I, I was specifically thinking of this last week when it was Valentine's Day. She speaks about the human heart and she speaks about love, um, the idea of love, but she doesn't. I, w I was thinking that I would have liked to also written to have written something uh, more directly about what love does to you. Um, but Adina is not really a romantic being. She, I think, is on the ace spectrum, I think, um, is aromantic. So, and that's important about her. And I love that about her. Um, but I was thinking like, oh, I guess she doesn't really talk about 
how just orienting romantic love can be. And that's fine because there are plenty of books that do that. Also, Snow. I think that Adina would have really beautiful things to say about Snow's silencing effect and the calming effect of Snow. So I'm still taking notes. I'm still thinking, oh, Adina would have something really interesting to say about this. Um, and I'm still keeping them in a folder. There will be no sequel, but I think it's just, you know, for my own personal archive. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that if someone, you know, who hasn't read this thinks, well, this book, it spans a character's life. It's going to be, and it's not 3,000 pages, so they're going to expect broad mm. strokes, but it's very... Hmm. much detail oriented. Um, and like I was saying, I think, you know, Adina is a noticer and you get all these amazing details where if any were really changed, like everything else looks so different in her life. Um, thinking, you know, if she managed to not laugh in a key moment, if the family had <laughs> gone to a steakhouse instead of a seafood restaurant, it, you know, if the mother left the fax machine where it belonged, like any of those things, the trajectory changes quite a bit. Um, and so you were starting to, you know, you start to answer this, like the noticing, um, and it seems like that was a trait that you've always had, but did you find that it was just a continuation of what you were doing or something that you needed to hone in order to write Adina? Like, is there something that you had to say, like maybe put some sort of filters on to like formulate these sort of observations for her or is this how it would have just kind of come out of you naturally yeah I think it was a little of both I think that it was what I was already doing and then once I saw that what I was already doing was maybe adding up to something I began to look at it and manipulate it so that it could be doing it more effectively and even stronger was the hope. And it reminds me, you know, there was a moment when I was growing up, I, like Adina, I was raised by a single mother who tried really hard and, and you know, worked 15,000 hours a day and, you know, did her best and made mistakes and, and all of that. And, you know, did a beautiful job and grew alongside me in, in many, many ways. And one time we were driving and she would every so often we didn't have she didn't have a lot of time for moments of levity but every so often this poetic soul would leak out and she would say things like you know some people just drive in cars marie they just drive and they don't make jokes and they don't point out interesting things to the people they're driving with they just drive in cars and it, it's those moments of insight that from my mother specifically, and then from other people later in my life, who that taught me how to notice things because she was always seeing things that other people were not mentioning. And if I got too excited or I tried too hard to, to get those things from her, you know, she would immediately clam up. But I came to really love and look forward to, and then write down the moments when, when she would say those things. And I think those occasional moments comprise Adina entirely and her work on this earth. Mm. Trying to figure out how much, how many more questions I can ask here, but I, I didn't want to <laughs> um, kind of, I mean, and, and thinking about that, you know, and when she goes to New York and um, there's like this other level of noticing that's happening because now she's in, you know, brand new place. And mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think about how to put this. So I, I take the bus, which is not very usual for um, outside of New York, I hear. And I try to explain to people who don't take the bus. And there's like the world of the bus, all the things that happen there. And I feel like when I was reading that, you know, New York and, and you know, the observations about the subway and how New Yorkers relate to one another, um, I was getting that same kind of sense. Um, 
and I just totally lost track of where I was going with that. Um, the but bus. I guess there, there are the levels. There's a, like you were, when you were describing the structure at the beginning of like where she's advancing, um, you also capture that in the kinds of transmissions and, and so forth, like, you know, what exactly she's noticing. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. The operations huh. of everyday things become very important once you notice them. The act of paying attention to something makes something significant. And so in Adina's situation, it would be the subway. But if she were to take the bus, she would also find that very, very interesting. She would notice all, all these different things that maybe as everyday bus riders, we would gloss over or not pay as much attention to anymore. I think that's her particular perspective because she is an extraterrestrial or mm. she believes herself to be an extraterrestrial. Yes. Um, okay, so I think uh, two more questions. One is, which I think you could take in either direction, which is either when was the writing easiest for you or when did you have to just stop and think about like what direction it needed to go in? Well, Adina, when Adina reaches or is getting toward middle age, she encounters a few losses that I really had to take my time with. And because she's a reporter, she wouldn't look away from certain human, I'll say human experiences that others take great pains and go to great lengths to look away from. She had to look at them. That meant I had to look at them and not only look at them, but observe them and render them. And so I don't think it gives too much away because you can imagine that human life involves death. So at, at certain points she had to render death. I had to render death. And I wanted to do so with like, with linguistic dignity and honesty. It helped that I was at the time going through a certification program for end of life facilitation. And I used what I learned, some of what I learned in those studies to render what I hoped would be a surprising and unusually accurate scene of someone passing away. Mm. Thank you. Um, and I guess my last question, and then Omar can let us know if other, if some of the listeners have questions. Um, after everyone who's listening reads Beauty Land, where should they go next? Should they go into like something from your previous work or something that you're working on currently that's coming out next year? <laughs> or just oh, more I think I think they should go to film. I think they should go and watch E.T. and Contact <laughs> and Close Encounters of the Third Kind and Brother from Another Planet. And uh, gosh, what else? They should watch Moonstruck because just everybody should watch Moonstruck. Um, and, and yeah, and I think that, yeah, I think they should just go and watch film. And then if they are interested in any of my other books, that's great. They can check out Parakeet. And I have a collection of stories <laughs> that's going to come out next year um, that, in 2025, which will be fun. But yeah, go to film. I always, after I read something, well, and hopefully they would love it. But after I read or read something I really love, I I find I have to just go get lost in film for a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's such an unliterary thing to say, but it's the truth. <laughs> I mean, I had to stop and, um, you know, when there were certain songs mentioned, I had to stop and go into Spotify and pull up things I hadn't listened to in years. So, yeah, hey. it's, you know, why not? What did you listen to? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, I wouldn't, I don't know that I've ever actually left the nineties. So, you know, I wouldn't write back into like all of the grudge. And honestly, <laughs> one of the, um, Bjork's human behavior was just not that it was, you know, in there, but like the whole book, I'm just like, I, Bjork, I was basically convinced was an alien anyway. Mm -hmm. And the whole, that whole song is just like, what do you make of people? And I'm like, yeah, this is like the entire book is what do you make of people? Like, why do they act like this? Um, so not like directly connected, but like, oh, absolutely. 
That is brilliant. We had so Generation X, not to um, not to brag, but Generation X had so many cool extraterrestrial adjacent figures Mm -hmm. in our music and in our in our pop culture scene. Bjork was definitely one of them. I am an enormous PJ Harvey fan. I think that her music could make aliens really, really happy, let alone all the humans it makes really happy. Yeah, Bjork's a great touchstone. Mm. Yes, thank you so much. Um, Omar, what questions do people have? Yeah, we have have a a few questions here. Um, Paul asks, Adina's mom is maybe my favorite character. How would she deal with Adina's deactivation? (laughs) Um, Well, without giving too many spoilers, Paul, I would say that um, she would maybe deal with that the way she deals with other evidence of Adina's extraterrestrialness in Adina's life. For example, what I would consider to be a coming out scene when Adina tries to tell her mother who she believes she is, her true authentic self, her mother kind of half turns away from the idea. I don't think she's able to face it. I don't think she's able to bear it. And I, I think that some of that wishful thinking and, and wishful disbelief would probably surround the idea of ever losing her daughter in any significant way. Um, I can't speak for all single mothers who are lower income, but I would imagine that mine um, would find it super unbearable the idea of deactivation and would do whatever she could to make sure it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, Rebecca asks, um, I should have asked this first because it was a good segue to the last, to the last thing you all were talking about. Um, Can you talk about the significance of music in Beautyland and how you selected the songs most important to Adina? Absolutely. It, that was so important to me. It, it was what would naturally be popular at the time of her life because her lifespan goes from the 1970s to present day, dot, dot, dot. And so I looked for music that would not only be popular then, but would also point out something significant, but not obvious about the story or Adina's life either her situation at the time or what she was going to experience in her life. I really loved Barracuda, Hart's Barracuda at the beginning of her life because of the force behind it, what she was imagining her life would be like and what it turned out to be like being two different things. And I think she imagined her life being as fierce as the sisters in Hart. And it turned out to be, you know, less less fierce and less glamorous than that um and then the golden record that's on the voyager spacecraft becomes incredibly important to adina voyager one becomes a sibling to adina throughout her life and all of her major milestones happen to correspond with important developments in voyager one as well and voyager one's record was important to me in my research. And I refracted it in different ways throughout the novel that I think are subtle um, and then more obvious. So when she is dating that pianist with synesthesia, at one point he plays a song from the golden record for her. And she says it's like really loud and jangly and it and it hurts her ears. And then he says, well, what do you think of it? And she says, it's loud. And in that way, that was literally Carl Sagan's golden record being played for an extraterrestrial in my mind, which is which was the goal of the golden records on Voyager. And I thought that was like 
a funny way to reflect both Voyager's intention in a really human, small, humorous way um, in, in Adina's actual life. So, so music is endlessly important to me. And I had to kind of tone down all the ways I wanted to use it in Beautyland so that, you know, it, did, it just didn't become a, a mixtape, essentially. <laughs> well, it would be cool to hear the, uh, the Beautyland um, playlist. Um, I do have one. It's on Spotify. <laughs> you can find it. It's under my name. Okay. And there awesome. is a playlist of all the songs that are mentioned in Beautyland. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um Andromaki um um wrote a little bit um here um he says no earthly words can adequately describe how much I loved this book the ending caught me completely off guard as I hadn't made the connection between the stages of a star's life cycle and that of Adina's without spoiling too much I want to ask you about the use of we in the book's final line. So we'll, we'll tr have to tread carefully here. Um, in mm -hmm. one of her final transmissions, Adina was surprised to use we, realizing that she had probably assimilated to the human experience more than she thought. So who is the we in the final line? Are we humans welcoming her and finally accepting her or is it her alien family? Uh, there's no way of answering that question <laughs> on on uh, in this scenario that wouldn't I'll say take away the reader's ability to decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. I will say that pronouns are incredibly important in Beautyland. So her superiors go by the singular plural. And she refers to Solomon, her teacher in the night classrooms as they, and she becomes transfixed by Pando, which is a real, the, most, the biggest, the largest organism on earth in Utah is a forest of aspen trees. Um, but it's really just one tree and it's the singular plural. And then Adina goes from using human beings do this, human beings do that, to we do this and we do that as, as um, the person who asked that question expertly noted. And then at the very, very end, um, something happens that I think calls into question exactly who is telling the story the entire time. And that ending means a whole lot to me. It came late in the process of writing the book. And um, what I will say is that I believe Adina. Excellent. Um, Paul asks another question about Adina's mom. Um, he says Adina's mom is always responsible, but for most of, of the book, she seems emotionally detached. She later says she always tried to make Adina strong. At the end, she reveals how much she always loved Adina. Was this development planned in the writing? Yes, it was actually. And the mother progressed and developed through several revisions. Um, I think emotional detachment might be a necessary quality when you don't have any money and you're trying to give your daughter a good life by working as hard as you possibly can. So I don't know that that emotional detachment would be the word that I would search for with Adina's mom, though I think that it it might be experienced as as that. Um, but I think that Adina's mother would probably see it as doing what she had to do in the way she had to do it 
so that she could afford for Adina to go to the schools that could help her. But yes, her mom developed a lot throughout the revision process and wasn't really, her character wasn't actually a giant part of the story in the first drafts. And my very wise agent, Claudia Ballard, who I think at this point knows my process better than I do, was like, this mother seems really important. And right now she's reading a very one note. Why don't you bring her into the story more? And then as soon as I did, I was like, oh, this is this is what it needs to be. The story, the first part of Adina's development is a two-hander, as they say, between her and her mom. And I'm just so happy that that character exists now because I really, really, really love her. Um doesn't look like we have any questions left. Um, Carrie, was there anything um, that you wanted to ask before we close close up for this evening? Nothing quick. I just um, wanted to uh, <laughs> thank you again so much for the conversation and for writing this because it was like the book I didn't know I needed um, for like eight different reasons. So thank you. I agree. It did the same thing for me, Carriana. So I'm I'm glad that it did that for you as well. And if I could also say, um, I answered a couple questions ago, I finished with that I believe Adina. But I also want to add to that, that the reader is free to believe whatever they want to believe. And it's been a life's delight hearing some of the opinions that some readers have. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. This was delightful to talk to you. Yeah, it was a pleasure to have both of you. Um, and and literature that keeps you keeps you thinking and wondering and and maybe creating your own uh fan fiction in your head about what what's going on or what's about what's gonna happen in the future is is just the best. Um, so thanks again to both of you and thanks to our audience for joining us. Um, we will be putting this recording up on YouTube. I'll do that tomorrow. Um, and um, yeah, um, please buy Beautyland if you haven't already. Um, and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.